welcome to The Global Current. I'm Joshua Siegel. And I'm Megan Ferguson. In news, elections in Venezuela. Historic warnings about air pollution in Beijing. And the United Kingdom begins bombing ISIS in Syria. In analysis, the United Kingdom's referendum on remaining in the EU. And Finland's revolutionary basic income program. Then, The Global Current brings you an interview with Vincent Medina on the evolution of terrorism and the world's response. Thanks for tuning in, and enjoy the show. And now, Karina Hendren reports on elections in Venezuela. On Sunday, December 6th, the opposition party in Venezuela was victorious in overtaking a two-thirds majority of the National Assembly. The Venezuelan government has been under socialist rule for the past 17 years. According to The Guardian, the vote occurred in the midst of an economic crisis in Venezuela, which is being caused by declining oil prices. According to CNN, Venezuela has been hit with major inflation and has seen a rise in violence and insecurity. According to a Pew Research poll, 85% of Venezuelans are unhappy with the direction of their country. The opposition party, Mesa de la Unidad Democrática, gained 99 seats in Congress, while the Partido Socialista Unido de Venezuela retained only 46 seats. According to CNN, there was a 74.3% voter turnout, which suggests that a large portion of the Venezuelan population is backing the change. President Nicolas Maduro gave a speech on Monday admitting his defeat, but maintaining that he would not let the loss result in anything detrimental for his party. In Venezuela, the opposition hasn't won. In Venezuela, circumstantially today, the counter-revolution has won at doors. According to The Guardian, Maduro stated, the bad guys won like the bad guys always do, through lies and fraud. Workers of the fatherland know that you have a president, a son of Chavez, who will protect you. According to CNN, Maduro also stated that he would hold an extraordinary Congress to find out why his party lost the election. Some of the main goals of the MUD, headed by Enrique Capriles, are to remove Maduro and some Supreme Court justices from office. They also seek to release various opposition leaders who have been imprisoned by Maduro. The MUD seeks to do this by means of an amnesty law, which according to CNN, Maduro has vowed to veto. Many opposition leaders state that they will wait and see if Maduro takes steps to fixing Venezuela's economic issues before making vows to impeach him. During a rally after their victory, a MUD party member had this to say about the importance of the results of the election. The country wants a change, and the change begins today. The agenda of peace reigns. The agenda of the citizens was imposed. The vote democratically defeated the government that isn't democratic. This is Karina Hendren for The Global Current. Up next, Yilin Du reports on historic warnings on air pollution in Beijing. On December 7th, Beijing issued a red alert to the residents warning against the severe smog. According to the New York Times, this is the first time they had raised the alarm to its highest level since the emergency air pollution response system was announced in 2013. The red alert requires school closings and operation of cars to be regulated according to license plate number. Outside barbecues and fireworks are banned and government agencies are to reduce automobile usage by 30 percent. The alert comes to citizens on a short notice. Yet, the health of Beijing residents has already been severely affected. Allergies, asthma, and other health issues have been attributed to severe smog. Jia Xiaojiang, a Beijing resident, stated in a CNN interview, The smog is like toxic gas. I never had a sore throat before, but since last year, my throat has been hurting when I speak more. The New York Times gave an update to the smog issue in Beijing on December 8th. According to the article, by 4 p.m., walking the dim street was like scrolling through a coal mine. The Municipal Air Quality Index read 308, rated hazardous by United States standards, a level at which people should not set foot outdoors. Most of the smog comes from the industrial burning of coal in northern China. Beijing's mayor, Wang Anshan, has made a post on Beijing's government's official online news portal asking for the support and understanding of residents. It is a critical time in Beijing that requires all residents to work together to fight air pollution. This is Elaine Du from The Global Current. Next, this morning, Liam Skolins reports on the United Kingdom's recent decision to bomb ISIS in Syria. On December 2nd, the United Kingdom's House of Commons voted to begin a coordinated bombing campaign against the Islamic State. According to The Guardian, 
Prime Minister David Cameron, who supports the bombing, had the support of his own Conservative Party, as well as a sizable proportion of the Labour Party opposition. The vote carried by a majority of 174 votes, with 397 for and 223 against. Labour Party leader Jeremy Corbyn vehemently opposes the military effort. Following the vote, 10 British RAF planes from bases in Cyprus attacked several targets in IS-controlled oil fields. A separate Guardian article states that members of Parliament justified their vote by citing UN Security Council Resolution 2249, which urges UN member states to redouble and coordinate their efforts to prevent and suppress terrorist acts committed specifically by IS. While the British military effort has gained broad support within the UK government and from nations such as France and Germany, a large proportion of the UK's population adamantly oppose the action in the Middle East. In a speech given to Parliament, MP Hilary Benn voiced his support for the bombing plan and placed his faith in the Vienna peace talks which have been underway since the end of October. We are part of a coalition of over 60 countries standing together shoulder to shoulder to oppose their ideology and their brutality. Now, Mr. Speaker, all of us understand the importance of bringing an end to the Syrian civil war. And there is now some progress on a peace plan because of the Vienna talks. They are the best hope we have of achieving a ceasefire. Now, that would bring an end to Assad's bombing. A report by The Independent details the Veterans for Peace organization, which decries the government's actions. Across the country, veterans have thrown away their war medals in protest of another engagement in the Middle East. The head of Veterans for Peace, Ben Griffin, contends that IS grew because of the violence committed by Western forces during the Iraq War. Labor Party leader Jeremy Corbyn also supports this claim and condemns the current military intervention. The Independent also reported that the public is torn over whether or not to support the government's escalation of the conflict. Some citizens are weary of entering another protracted Middle Eastern conflict. This is Liam Scollins reporting for The Global Current. Coming up next, Bill Goldblatt shares Troy Travato's analysis of the United Kingdom's referendum on remaining in the EU. The United Kingdom is a peculiar state. It is not a federal system like the U.S. or Brazil, where states share sovereignty with the central government. It is a unitary state, much like Italy or France. Sovereignty lies fully with the parliament at Westminster. However, the United Kingdom is not really a country at all. Within its borders, there are four constituent countries, England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. Each country, except England, has a local national assembly as part of a greater push for devolved national powers in the late 20th century. However, London may dissolve these bodies at its pleasure if it deems fit. The United Kingdom is also a member of the Greater European Union. The state reluctantly joined in 1973. Opinions of the EU are rather diverse within the United Kingdom, influencing major elections and referenda, as recent as the Scottish Referendum for Independence in 2014. In the elections held last year, a major question was whether or not a newly independent Scotland would automatically be allowed to resume membership in the EU. This uncertainty was amplified by the fact that Scotland is the least Eurosceptic country within the United Kingdom. In fact, the only location besides Scotland that has such a positive view of Brussels is London, a city of which 37% of its population is foreign-born. According to the market research firm Ipsos Mori, Scottish support for the European Union is at 65% as of early November 2015. This is drastically higher than England's 40% in a September poll conducted by YouGov. The great disparity in opinions within Britain about its place in Europe has only been increased by the current refugee and economic migrant crisis afflicting the Union member states. Prime Minister David Cameron has attempted to renegotiate British obligations to Brussels. These include protection of the single market for Britain and other non-Euro countries, boosting competitiveness by setting a target for the reduction of the burden of red tape, exempting Britain from further integration efforts, and restricting EU migrants' access to benefits such as tax credits, according to the BBC. The reforms, however, do not seem to go far enough for Eurosceptics. In a recent interview, Nigel Farage, leader of the United Kingdom Independence Party and member of the European Parliament, explained how he and his party view Cameron's negotiation strategy. I mean, what we're seeing so far uh, is a renegotiation in which the Prime Minister is asking for virtually nothing. Um, He's trying to frame the debate um, around benefits for migrants when actually it's not about that. Uh, It's about sheer numbers that come. It's about change to communities. It's about wage compression for ordinary workers. So what I'm going to be saying is we're not going to wait. While Cameron's Conservative government will dictate the framework of this referendum, the First Ministers of both the Welsh and Scottish legislatures hold similar views on its outcome. 
Here is what Scotland's Nicola Sturgeon had to say in an interview with Euronews. I will argue in the EU referendum that the UK should stay in because I think it's overwhelmingly in our interest. I've set out as a statement of fact that if after that referendum Scotland finds itself outside because the UK has voted that way, even though we voted to stay in, I think there would be a lot of people who would say, hold on, we don't want to be out of the European Union, we want to look again at whether we should be an independent member of the European Union. The two leaders have insisted that a vote to leave the EU would only be valid if every nation of the UK voted to do so, the so-called double majority, according to The Guardian. This is clearly seen as an attempt for the local assemblies of Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland to further make known their presence to Parliament, further threatening English control of Westminster altogether. Reading for Troy Travado, this is Bill Golba on The Global Current. And now, Blythe Brady analyzes Finland's basic income program. In May, Finland's center-right party came to power, promising to usher in a new period of political experiments, including the idea of a basic income. The Prime Minister, Juha Spiele, has publicly supported the idea of a basic income and has tasked the Finnish Social Insurance Institution to prepare proposals for testing the concept, Vox.com reports. What is a basic income, and why has Finland's investigation into it garnered international attention? A basic income is a form of social security, as Prime Minister Spiele has commented. The BBC reports that a basic income involves the payment by the government of a specified sum each month to all adult citizens, regardless of how much a citizen earns from other sources. The sum would be paid regardless of whether a citizen is employed or not, and any additional income earned by a citizen would be subject to income tax. Finland is facing 10% unemployment, with 22.7% of youth unemployed. In a country of just 5.4 million people, these unemployment rates are worrying. Furthermore, due to a quirk in Finnish law, taking a paid temporary job can cost more than remaining unemployed because a paid temporary job results in lower welfare benefits, according to the BBC. As Neil Lawson, chair of the Compass Campaign Group, states on BBC Nights News, the economy is changing and employment options are changing with it. The social security system is broken. It was invented in 1945 and the world's moved on from men going to factories, you know, and earning a wage and, you know, that world's gone. Um, but, but a new world is coming, a, a new world where technology is going to displace actually lots of jobs. And there's going to be a huge productivity gain from that. And unless we want food riots, then we're going to have to find a way of paying people to, to spend money in the, in the supermarkets. <laughs> The proposed basic income would alleviate that issue, many in Finland hope, by remaining a steady amount even if a person takes a temporary paid job. The basic income would replace the current unemployment benefits as well as aspects of the welfare system, reports CNN Money. In fact, the Finnish Social Insurance Institution is still debating the sum which would be used in an experiment. Sums range from 550 euros to 800 euros a month or 650 to 880 US dollars, although nothing has been decided as of now. The proposed amounts, it is hoped, will not be enough to discourage the youth from looking for jobs, which has been a prevailing criticism levied against the proposal in the international media. In the United States, conservative commentators frequently levied a charge against the US welfare system. However, Finland is not alone in seeking to keep its social safety net while reducing its cost and bureaucracy. The city of Utrecht in the Netherlands will introduce a basic income in 2016, and Switzerland will be holding a referendum on whether to begin a basic income, reports Quartz.com and the BBC. Additionally, a pilot program in India in 2010 found that people who received the government payments displayed more entrepreneurial behavior than the people who did not receive government payments, reports the Huffington Post. Finland is a long way off from introducing a universal basic income, despite what headlines claim. The proposed experiment would be set to begin in 2017 and last two years. There is also an interesting constitutional issue, which will have to be decided in Finnish courts before such an experiment could take place, reports the BBC. Finland's constitution states that each citizen must be equal, meaning that every citizen shall be equally treated by the government, institutions, and employment, regardless of sex, age, and origin. 
Under the proposed pilot project, participants would be placed in an unequal position from the citizens not participating, which would violate the Constitution. Those who are receiving the basic income will naturally be unequal to those who are not. Whether this constitutional obstacle will disrupt the national experiment with universal basic income is yet to be seen. If Finland is able to conduct a pilot program, the world's attention is likely to focus on the Scandinavian country and governments could be taking their lead from the land of the midnight sun. Reporting for The Global Current, this is Blythe Brady. Finally, this morning, Emily Lividay sits down with Vincent Medina to discuss the evolution of terrorism and the world's response. Good morning, Global Current listeners. This is Emily Lividay. I am here with Vicente Medina, author of Terrorism Unjustified and Associate Professor of Philosophy here at Seton Hall University. Welcome. Congratulations on your new book. Thanks so much. So, how exactly has terrorism changed over the years? When you look at the history of terrorism, you have different waves as David Rappaport revived his research on terrorism. If you go back, and then you can do it in different ways, but Rappaport talks about four waves. first wave was what he described as the anarchist wave. It was in the 1880s, where the terrorists a positive connotation. The term terrorist has a, pos a positive connotation back then. Then you have the anti-colonial wave from 1920s, that again, the whole notion of freedom fighter terrorists still has some kind of positive connotation because you were trying to expel foreign powers from different lands. And then from 1960 until 1990s, Rappaport calls that new left terrorism, and it was more mostly ideological based on the uh, confrontation between the Soviet Union and the West. And then from 1990s until the present, then we have what he calls the religious wave, where now religion plays an important role in militant jihadism. So would you say religion is the prime reason for terrorism today, or are there other factors that are leading into it that is more important? Not only religion. Religion is one among many of the factors. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Robert Pape has done a great deal of research in explaining why there are political reasons for that. So the jihadists, the militant jihadists, are also responding to the presence of foreign troops in the Holy Land, and also the fact that many countries, including the United States, also have been siding with despotic uh, regimes in the region for quite a long time, like the Saudis. And so there is a political component and there is a religious component. There is both. But I think it's quite unique nowadays that religion, and especially Islam, is playing an important role in the militant jihadism. Do you know what factors have caused this new shift to religion being the reason for terrorism now, as opposed to the past? I think that is an excellent question that nobody has been able to answer, to the best of my knowledge nowadays, <laughs> and we keep trying to look for answers. So, certainly they're not economics. Mm -hmm. That's not the main reason. It could be one among others, but I don't think that economics is the main reason, because many of these folks are middle-class people who are educated and they're willing to simply give their life for, for the, their cause, their version of Islam and their political movement. So I think there is, there, is, there is ideological components and there is a religious component, and who knows, there might be something else there, uh, perhaps an indoctrination too that they have been exposed to early on in their life, but that's very difficult to say. Mm -hmm. How can governments prevent terrorism from happening within their own borders? There are uh, a number of measures that people are taking depending on the tradition, the historical and constitutional tradition of each country. If you, re if you go focus on what happened in Paris now, the French has reacted with a state of emergency for three months. That's simply not feasible in the United States, given our constitutional tradition. So for the French now, they're able to, to act on it and, uh, and suspend all these civil and political rights in trying to prevent that. In the United States, we take a different approach, given our own constitutional tradition. Uh, so each country will have to see how they can respond constitutional liberal perspective to the challenge that they're facing, and at the same time, try to uphold the rule of law. So uh, that's a very uh, delicate balance, balancing act that they need to do.
Has the U.S. policy for dealing with terrorists changed over time? I think this has been evolving, mm -hmm. but especially after 9-11 is when we have seen how we have been dealing with this. I don't know that uh, it's been the most effective one. For instance, I don't think that uh, all the folks who are being kept at Guantanamo violating their rights and then giving them due process and classifying them as enemy combatants has helped in any way to combat terrorism because that, uh, their rights have been violated for so many years and uh, I don't think that's been effective the same way that the uh, invasion of Iraq, I think, actually promoted terrorism rather than trying to curtail terrorism. Whereas I think that Afghanistan has been different. So we need to take each case at a time and now what's going on in Syria is rather appalling so very difficult to, to deal with that because once you unleash these forces with the invasion of Iraq, it is extremely difficult to contain them now. So how is terrorism different across the world? How is terrorism in the Middle East different from terrorism in Africa, in Asia? If we're talking about uh, militant jihadists, they're very similar, but they have also their own specific uh, variables depending on it's Africa or the Middle East or the United States. But terrorism, it, uh, first of all, we need to understand that those we call terrorists are aiming at deliberately or recklessly harming innocent civilians. Mm -hmm. And no one has a monopoly on that. So not the militant jihadis, nor anybody else, because you have also the white supremacist groups here too that are quite dangerous and they have demonstrated also the power of using terrorism to harm innocent civilians. So, and, you, and in Europe too, you have seen that uh, with Breivik in, in, in Norway. But those are from ideological purposes. And then what you have now, the broader aspect of terrorism is a militant jihadism. And that's roughly the same in different, in, in different countries and in different parts of the world. So in your opinion, who is the most dangerous terrorist group that poses the biggest threat either to the world or just to America? I would say that both Daesh or uh, ISIS and, uh, and uh, Al-Qaeda, mm -hmm. they're both as, uh, as dangerous as any other. Uh, those are the main groups. What we need to be concerned with is if these folks are able to get hold of weapons of mass destruction. Mm -hmm. Because if they are able to get hold of weapons of mass destruction, then my sense is that they will have no qualms in using them. So this is a serious threat. On the other hand, we need to be also level-headed because if we focus on the probability being a victim of a terrorist attack in a non-conflict zone, the probability is basically negligible. Under one stipulation, it will be one over 14 million that you, you're going to suffer uh, and uh, be a victim of a terrorist attack. So that's negligible. On the other hand, we have, as I said, the probability and possibility that they can get weapons of mass destruction, and that we need to be very careful about that. So is there a reason why jihadists are more dangerous than, say, a white supremacist group within America? I think what is most dangerous about jihadists is that they're willing to engage in what they call martyrdom operations, namely blowing themselves up. And usually white supremacists don't do that, even though they might be as least lethal as the jihadists but the fact that we have so many young, educated folks, including females, some females, to actually kill themselves in the name of Islam is extremely worrisome because it's not only one or two individuals. We're talking about hundreds of individuals who are willing to do that. And that presents, I think, an unprecedented threat. So the U.S. is gathering intelligence to keep its citizens Safe. Is this intelligence targeting certain people? Is it violating people's rights? I think sometimes it does. We violated individual rights and after 9-11 in order to keep us safe. And uh, I guess that's the balancing act that we need to keep in mind, uh, in protecting civil liberties and at the same time mm -hmm. protecting the, uh, the safety of the citizens. It's unavoidable that something is going to suffer when you have this unprecedented threat. Given what it was in 9-11 and even afterwards, I think we need to be very careful about that. How do we balance that? Uh, but we, what we need to focus is not so much on any ordinary citizens, but on people who are potential terrorists. And, uh, for example, now I just read this morning that Congress has agreed to revise the visa program 
Oh. Right, and mm-hmm. I think that uh, in order to vet those who are coming into the United States, so now they're going to require, at least if that version of the bill uh, passes, then uh, they will require individuals coming from Iraq or Syria to apply for a visa. They're not going to be able to come here with a 90-day stay with no visa, visa at all. And oh. uh, from other countries, too, they're having this very insistent now uh, revamp there to make it more t- uh, easier, to make it easier to vet the entrance of these folks into the United States. So that's one view uh, that we have. I mean, there might be other laws that we can come up with into, to try to focus on a segment of the population that presents a risk to the safety of the United States and other countries, too. I think a major problem with terrorism abroad is that it's fed into a lot of phobia here in America, especially people are fearing Muslim Americans. Is this fear justified? It doesn't seem to be that way. If you take how many, how, it depends on the many cases that we have had being a few after 9-11. That 9-11 is a catastrophe. But then the, after 9-11, there have been very few cases. There are still, we were uh, fortunate to prevent that. Unfortunately, we were not we were not able to prevent the one in San Bernardino, uh, but uh, we were able to uh, prevent those. And these are uh, you know, a few people who are involved with this. Uh, so to simply lump everyone together uh, under the same rubric, what you do is just uh, promote Islamophobia and actually incentivize more t- uh, terrorist threats rather than try to prevent it. My sense is that we need to be very careful and uh, respect uh, the Constitution and the rule of law and also be aware that the threat of a terrorist attack is uh, rather minimal in the United States or in any other state for that matter other than uh, areas where there is uh, conflict going on like Syria or or Iraq or Pakistan or the places where people are, are, are more likely to die of terrorism. So in your research, did you find any terrorist group that the media may have overlooked or Americans would be surprised to hear about? Not in this particular book, but I, I did uh, some research in, in the past. I think uh, there are some uh, white supremacist groups that I think it's important to keep an eye on these folks and, uh, and also the fact that now the extreme right has just won the elections in France and they have presence also in Germany and in England too. Uh, some of these folks could evolve and become more belligerent at any given time. So we need to keep an eye on those folks too, because uh, given their Islamophobic reaction or anti-immigrant reaction, that mm-hmm. could present a serious danger for uh, uh, you know innocent citizens everywhere. So how can Americans prevent terrorism and the negative stereotypes that come along with it? Uh, education. I mean, we need to educate people, people to be aware of that. For instance, very few people are aware that the probability of terrorism is almost negligible, that you, are, that you can actually, you are more likely to be hit by a meteorite than to be killed by a terrorist act. So people tend to be afraid and then not reasonable when they are threatened. So education is, is one way. I think the government can do a great deal, and I think that uh, higher education and also in, the, in high school to try to make people more... T- aware of the real threat that is out there and perhaps learn more about uh, Islam, for instance, and, uh, and their cultural traditions, which is quite rich to be able to not start stereotyping everyone. That's about all the time we have. Thank you so much. My guest today was Vicente Medina, author of Terrorism Unjustified, and I'm Emily Livaday for The Global Current. into this week's episode of The Global Current. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. I'm Megan Ferguson. And I'm Joshua Siegel. We'll We'll see see you next week. The Global Current is brought to you by the School of Diplomacy and International Relations at Seton Hall University. Our executive producer is Alicia Sharabali. Our associate producer is Bill Gola. Our news editor is John Janot, and our analysis editor is Blythe Brady. Our interview segment is produced by Emily Lividay. The Global Current theme song is Acid Jazz by Kevin McLeod. You've been listening to The Global Current on WSOU 89.5 FM, Seton Hall's Pirate Radio.